We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Weed Talk Now. I am the founder of Pro Cannabis Media. My name is Jimmy Young. And I am Kurt Dalton, the founder of Cannabis.net. And joining us is also the CEO of Revolutionary Clinics. His name is Keith Cooper. Keith, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Hey, Jimmy and Kurt. Nice to be here. How many Zoom meetings are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. In our business, um, you know, we run a cultivation facility, which is running 24-7, 365 days a year. We have three retail locations that are open seven days a week. Uh, so... Uh, probably less than most. Uh, so I, I still believe in showing up and, and walking the talk. Uh, so I'm, I'm in those facilities uh, four or five days a week out of the seven. You know, when you and I first met and talked, and uh, that was a couple of years ago at this point, um, I was very impressed with your management style. You are definitely one who likes to go and talk directly to your employees. Is that an accurate description of your style? Yeah, I, th I think it comes uh, from what you see behind me here. A lot of sports uh, growing up, uh, certainly, um, you know, a, a, an awesome family. But what I learned early in the sports arena is that you can be fabulous as an individual athlete, but if you're playing a team sport, you have to understand how to be a team member as well as a leader. And so uh, I take that to the office with me every single day. You know, I can, I can do so much to build up the team. I can do so much to help them learn and, and so forth. Um, and then I'm just one of them. I'm just one of the gang and one of the team members uh, every single day in this business. Hey, Keith, I think we, uh, I covered, I think, your Somerville opening. I'm just curious, as a business owner and when you got started here in Mass., which store or which uh, opening what really like kind of hammered home like you're you did it you're successful you're here you've accomplished your goal was it the opening uh, of the first one or kind of the Cambridge store maybe walk us through what each event was like for you as an entrepreneur yeah so um, I, I'm not new to the game uh, of, of opening businesses uh, this is my uh, seventh company uh, that I've been uh, either a CEO or president of. Uh, most of them were startups. Some of them were growth stage companies. Um, I wasn't a cannabis guy, as I think we talked about uh, three years ago, just before I joined this. I had sold a digital health company that, uh, that we had spun out of Boston University. So I had a lot of experience in growing companies to many hundreds of people and and many hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues. Uh, but this was brand new to me by way of cannabis, number one, and brick and mortar retail, number two, never mind the agriculture and the regulations and everything else that layers on top of this. As it relates to this specific opportunity with revolutionary clinics in the cannabis space, I have to say that um, that initial opening in Somerville uh, was still a signal event for me in the history of the business and the history of my experience in it, because we didn't know back then when we were going to get open. When I joined the company in July of 2017, the opening date was August 15th, and then it was September 15th, and then it was October, and then it was uh, the beginning of November, and there were all these uh, licenses and processes we had to go through, and I was on my way to, um, uh, to Vegas uh, to go to the MJ show, and suddenly we got the approval uh, email uh, and we were going to open two days later. So uh, a whole team of people went to Vegas. I stayed behind uh, to help run the store. And so that still is, is uh, like it was yesterday, frankly. It was a great experience seeing those first patients come through the door, myself not being uh, totally literate in, in the product or, or the applications. Uh, I learned every single day of those early visits with patients how important this was. What an amazing amazing compound it was and uh, how it helped so many people improve their lives. So that was a magic time. It, it's still every single time I go to the store and every single time I have an opportunity to spend time with patients, uh, whether they're employees of ours, uh, many of whom uh, are patients and, and or people that are visiting us for the first time or the hundredth time, I get amazing insights and, and clarity around how wonderful this product is. I, I think in that particular show too, I saw Ryan Anson on the on the show floor, and I remember him being pretty excited. I was like, "What are you guys going to open?" And he was like, "You won't believe it." So I, I, I can jump back to that memory too. Yep. Yeah, and and if you could uh, if you could have projected three years ahead to where we are now, there's a lot of other things you couldn't believe would have happened. Yeah, 
like a pandemic, for instance, let's just say, pandemic, right? Pandemic, uh, little um, licensing uh, delays, uh, little <laughs> vape bans, uh, little shutdown of the recreational industry. Yeah, lots has happened. Lots has happened. You've got to be very resilient in this business, and you've got to be very flexible so that you can adapt to the current circumstances. If you can't adapt, uh, you're not going to do well in this business. Yeah. Adapt and improvise. It's a theme of mine when I get in front of young people and try to explain to them some of the lessons you might actually want to learn from me um, as you move forward in life. But uh, I do before we touch on the city of Cambridge, I really do want to ask you and as a as a satisfied customer of Revolutionary Clinics, the transition to the curbside because of COVID-19 um, has been pretty seamless for me as a consumer or as a patient. Uh, I'm guessing that the impact on the bottom line, however, has not been something you are uh, very happy about. Yeah, well, we have um, two different businesses. Uh, one is our uh, medical dispensary business where we have the three stores, one in Somerville and two now open in Cambridge. And uh, the shift from uh, having a wonderful space for people to come in and to socialize uh, we had educational events. We had stash bashes, uh, Jimmy, that you've been to outdoors in our parking lots. All of that personal um, interaction uh, was was wonderful as it related to the relationships as well as the business. And uh, almost all of those have gone away, right? So, so that's one side of it. On the other hand, uh, dealing with the business in the way we've chosen to, and we, we always try to balance, uh, obviously, the service and the safety of our personnel and, and our and our clients, um, it's very different today uh, than it was three months ago. We have chosen to do all of our sales in either our vestibule or in the um, uh, uh, curbside, if you will. And so we don't have customers really coming into the, the heart of the store anymore, which is a dramatic difference. I mean, the reason why you go and you, you get real estate and you spend two years you know, finding it and building it out and getting the licensing is so that you can have a place where people can come and, and congregate and, and experience more than just coming in, buying a product and running out. Uh, and so our philosophy of wanting to educate and wanting to engage and wanting to become friends uh, with, uh, with the people that we serve has certainly shifted a bit. But I will tell you that more people than not appreciate the fact that we took those pretty dramatic actions. There are still a lot of companies in the business that um, you, you, you go into the store, you try to stand six feet apart, you're dealing with somebody, a PA or, or, or a bud tender behind a, um, a, a register. Again, we've chosen to do all of ours one step back to keep people even further apart. And they've been fantastic in understanding that that is uh, done for them as well as for our employees. And I will tell you that, um, the, the sales for, for the medical problem, uh, products uh, ha have really not suffered, Jimmy, um, as it relates to our business. Now, part of the reason we'll talk about Cambridge is because uh, we would have hoped by now to be in the adult use business also, and that would have been a very different outcome. But given that we're not, our retail stores are doing okay. Uh, it's our wholesale business, which we had to switch to because the recreational wasn't uh, imminent, in Somerville or Cambridge, uh, where we're selling products uh, to those recreational stores that don't necessarily have cultivation and processing, that business went south um, in a big way in a very short period of time. So that was a dramatic uh, loss for us. So you're telling me the freezer is full right now. <laughs> the freezer is full. Lots of good deals. Walk me through, and I know the you know the recreational um, you didn't have, but like you're a cannabis veteran in Massachusetts. Governor Baker comes out and says medical yes, rec no. What what's the next forty five seconds of your life like right there? Yeah, a few phone calls uh, from uh, teammates, investors, and people paying attention. Um, you know, I, I understand uh, why the governor made his decision based on the. Um, people that he had advising him and uh, his understanding of the industry uh, and, and his um, still getting used to it uh, over time because uh, he's a good man and he's a smart man. Uh, what we have had to do since then, and, and I'm chairman of the Commonwealth Dispensary Association, 
which represents about 80% of the establishments in Massachusetts that are in the business, both recreational and medical, as well as cultivation. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could come up with a plan that would help educate um, the governor, his staff, uh, and, and, the, and the health experts that were advising him that we could uh, very easily actually open up uh, again for adult use um, with a few limitations which would be obvious and are in place in many other establishments uh, like retail stores and the like. I mean, we're serving customers today effectively and safely uh, and um, the fact that we're not serving recreational customers doesn't mean we couldn't do that same thing. So we went to the governor and his team, especially this business advisory team that they established last week to propose our plan uh, for limiting uh, the number of people in the stores, for expanding curbside pickup, for expanding uh, delivery, keeping all of the obvious uh, hygiene and social distancing in place with what we do today, and adding to that limiting uh, to zero the number of out-of-state customers we would serve uh, for the foreseeable future until um, uh, the proof that we can operate safely as an adult use store or an adult use industry uh, is apparent. So yes, we had some, uh, some, some interesting and stressful times and calls in the hours and days after the governor made that decision. Uh, but I would say that since then, we've been really tight as an industry and as, a, as an association in trying to be helpful and to try to be as informative as possible to proactively get back open, which I think we will uh, in the weeks to come. He, he said it's a non-starter on rec during his most, one of the most recent press conferences. Do you feel that might change? Do you think there's some hope there? Yeah, it, it will change, um, and, and everything's just a matter of timing. Um, I think um, he was concerned about the ability uh, for the industry to limit uh, customers to in-state versus out-of-state. There are certain laws and rules that regulate uh, that sort of interstate commerce. We happen to be in cannabis. It's already illegal uh, to bring product across the border, so it was unique from that standpoint. Uh, but also um, our ability uh, today, as we do with our medical program, to only serve in-state customers, that's the way it is, it makes it very easy for us to do the same thing uh, in an adult use business. So we've put it all on paper, we've made it very comprehensive, uh, we, we've, we've put a plan in front of his team that we think is, is a winning plan to get people back to work, to get the industry back open, and to get good and, and solid tax revenues uh, into the which are so much needed. Um, I understand there's also been a little bit of a movement on the state side, at least they're trying to create a fund to help out those that have been most impacted by this COVID-19, I'm talking about in the uh, cannabis space. Um, there's uh, some lobbying going on at the state house to try and come up with some funds for them. Uh, can you enlighten us that, on that at all? that, Jimmy. Um, I'm paying attention to it just like I am uh, with stuff at the federal level. Uh, right now, our biggest goal in all of our efforts are to um, show the governor and his team uh, that we can reopen adult use cannabis in Massachusetts safely, um, uh, securely, uh, and with great service. So uh, those, uh, those things would be helpful. You know, we're, we're one of the few companies, I think, that um, have not had uh, big layoffs uh, because, uh, number one, we're medical only on the retail side, uh, and everyone in the factory in Fitchburg um, is adding a ton of value as it relates to building up inventory for what we believe will be a reopening in the not-too-distant future. That's now May 18th is what the target date is to kind of loosen up the strings. They're starting to get some downward trends on the uh, results of, of COVID-19 testing and, and cases. Um, are you confident that on May 19th we'll see adult use recreation open? Uh, so, uh, you know, from your lips to uh, to the ears of whomever would make that final decision. Um, I don't know that May 19th um, is a realistic date, frankly, uh, just a couple of weeks from now. Um, 
you've seen that there's already been indications of certain industries and businesses that are, are going to be allowed to open. Healthcare uh, being at the top of the list for obvious reasons uh, with um, uh, people staying away from healthcare facilities that really need to be there uh, for surgeries or, or, or procedures. Um, I think there's a bunch of other industries, you know, golf industry, for example, that feels like a, a, a relatively easy decision uh, because it's easy to stay uh, socially distant. Uh, we'll be in that first wave, I think, Jimmy, um, of businesses that have shown that they can open and have a plan to do that responsibly uh, and productively. Um, I don't know that the 19th is the right date. Uh, what we would like is a date <laughs> so that we could plan. And that's really important because we're dealing with um, not just dollars and cents, but we're dealing with people. Uh, and, um, you know, our, our employees, um, uh, our investors, um, the people that care about um, our, our patients and our company uh, really would like to understand uh, what the plan is for the future. And it's hard for us as executives in a business like this to give them assurances, to, to make decisions that are rational without understanding whether it's uh, you know a week or a month or two months out there. So we'd love to have a date certain, uh, even if it's a couple of weeks after that, but, um, but the sooner the better. <laughs> so you mentioned, uh, Keith, the federal level you keep an eye on. And you know, the smartest guys in the room are telling me now that you know, based on a post-COVID recession, we're going to get a chance to legalize because we're going to need jobs and we're going to need tax revenue. <laughs> Are you on that train? And my argument has always been, if you really want to see that, you ha the worse it gets, the better chances get, get greater for cannabis legalization. Where are you on that? Um, I'm not so optimistic about that in the, in the near term. Um, you know, we're in an election year. Uh, who knows what's going to happen uh, this fall? That will determine a lot of what priorities are established, obviously, for that administration and for our industry. I think there are some really simple things they could do, including the States Act and, and, and taking care of banking and taking care of the tax problems and, and so forth. Um, uh, that's something that can be bipartisan and, and not change the world, but certainly help the industry quite dramatically. That, I hope, would be pressed forward um, in the next uh, year uh, to get passed. I think interstate commerce is much more complicated. Each state is at a different place in their maturity as, a, as an industry uh, for cannabis, uh, whether it's medical or, or recreational. And, um, you know, we saw in Massachusetts, even after uh, interstate commerce was allowed for, for wine and liquor, uh, Massachusetts held back for, um, I think, the better part of a couple of decades before uh, I could get a box of wine delivered to me directly from, um, from Napa. So, um, so there's a lot of complexities there. I, I think I'm, I'm bullish on those, um, those tax and uh, banking uh, regulations, which are just logical for everybody. Uh, it's win-win across the board. I'm less um, confident and optimistic about legalizing uh, the industry overall. Without asking your political beliefs and who you're going to vote for, is businessman Trump or Democrat Biden better just for cannabis in December of 2020? Um, you got to imagine that Biden's uh, probably better for that. Um, it, it will depend on what happens in Congress, obviously, uh, and, and the sway of balance there. There you go. Let's uh, let's talk a little politics again, shall we? And let's talk about city politics. And, you know, Keith, you have two dispensaries in Cambridge now, one in, in Central Square, one in Fresh Pond. You have gone and had some um, conflicts with the city of Cambridge, uh, I think might be a good way to look at it. Uh, they want to give opportunities, they being the city of Cambridge councilors, want to give opportunities to those who have been most impacted by the war on drugs, the economic empowerment applicants for licenses. And you are just trying, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will, um, that you're just trying to do what the law has allowed you to do as a business in this new industry, in that uh, medical dispensaries are more prepared to make that transition to adult use than somebody just coming into that particular um, arena, if you will. 
Where do you stand right now with the city of Cambridge? And if I am keeping score at home, I believe it is one and one. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's complicated uh, and, and multifaceted. Um, clearly, uh, when we got into the business uh, several years ago, uh, there was a clear uh, line um, of sight between investing in and standing up this industry, um, which was very, very risky, very hard, very expensive to build out cultivation facilities, processing labs before you even had any sales, and then to locate these um, uh, medical dispensaries throughout the state. And part of that was done with the promise uh, from the state and the statute that we would be able to convert to adult use cannabis as soon as it was available, uh, as soon as the voters uh, voted for it, and as soon as um, a reasonable time had passed for, for cities and towns to prepare. So there's really no dispute about that. That was the promise, that's what the statute said, that's what our rights are you know, legally uh, in place. What happened in Cambridge um, was really um, uh, unfortunate because um, the ability to create win-win situations, which I, uh, my entire career is, has been built on creating win-win situations so that you create a bigger pie so that everybody can, can do better, um, quickly turned into a, an us versus them. And, and unnaturally and, and um, uh, avoidably. Uh, so what we tried to do when there was a proposal for a two-year moratorium in the ordinance, which basically would have uh, totally taken away our rights to open, is to not not just fight and go to court and and, and make noise. Uh, we reached out to the folks that were um, uh, in Cambridge and wanted to get open uh, in the economic empowerment and social equity arena, and we met with them and we talked with them and we said, "Geez, what what it, what would it be like if we were to create a win-win solution together?" And uh, they were mostly enthusiastic. Uh, four out of five of the folks that were seriously interested in this business uh, came together with us and helped us form a, um, an alternative amendment to a two-year delay. And it, it meant putting to a fund together to enable them to open more quickly and more successfully with capital, uh, with um, operating guidelines with standard operating procedures, which often take uh, months and months and months to develop uh, and uh, are quite expensive to acquire, uh, and to help everybody get into business more quickly. Um, and that actually got a lot of traction. Uh, we had most of the city councilors, as well as most of the economic empowerment um, participants on board uh, with wanting to make that happen. Uh, but one or two people weren't. And they were uh, quite um, insistent and quite powerful. And, and, and it became a bit of a political situation where, you know, voting in favor of the two-year moratorium was somehow going to be voting in favor of the economic empowerment um, um, group. And voting against it would somehow um, be voting against them. And that was just simply not the case. It was a false narrative. Uh, the proposals that we had pulled together to help the industry and to lift all boats was far superior than putting a quash on the industry for two years. And we've seen that. It's been nine months, 10 months since that vote happened. And there are no stores open. Uh, and it's because there's a lack of capital and a lack of um, support uh, for those very people that um, the city council uh, was trying to help. So we did go to court. Uh, it was the only thing we could have done at the time, frankly. Uh, the judge voted in our favor. An appeals judge voted against us. We're going to go at this again. What a waste of time. What a waste of money. Right now in Cambridge, we could have four or five stores open. Three or four of those could be economic empowerment stores. If this fund had been established, it would have been a win-win situation. It would have been a hundred new jobs that could have been created very quickly. And these are good jobs. These are high paying jobs. These are jobs with benefits and that are full time. Uh, and instead, in the greatest economic crisis that we've faced in my lifetime, in the greatest jobless situation that we've had in, in decades and decades, um, the, the Cambridge situation is, is negating these jobs and is holding them back. Um, and it seems like a terrible time to do that. 
Uh, so we will, um, you know, fight the next fight uh, because that's what we need to do. And that's what we would do in any business. We will always continue to hold out our hands and ask that um, the parties come together uh, to cooperate and create win-win situations. I've done that uh, through letters. I've done that in person. And I've done that uh, on uh, forums like this to express my desire to create a, a happy and win-win situation where everybody can move forward um, equally uh, without this um, uh, two-year moratorium hanging over our heads. Does the frustrations that I hear in your storytelling and your, your voice, Keith, um, I know it bothers you um, because the big picture is we're talking about a, um, a legal product now in a state that's really progressive and yet you're still getting tied down by these uh, city governments, town governments that seem to like, I, I don't know if ego is involved here or if it's that power thing, but a lot of the host agreements, a lot of the problems that have happened with rolling out this industry have been tied to these host agreements, giving the towns, cities and towns of Massachusetts more power than perhaps they, well, certainly more than they're used to. Um, what, what's the biggest frustration for you? Well, the biggest frustration is that the voters, um, clearly in the cities in which we're involved, uh, Cambridge, um, at the top of the list, uh, voted overwhelmingly, uh, to get this industry up and running, uh, years ago. And here we are in the spring of 2020, uh, and there's one company that's opened in all of Cambridge. Uh, and it's medical only, and that's us. And, um, you know, that's, that's just not right. That's not what the voters asked for. Um, if you ask the citizens um, uh, about the tax dollars that they're losing and the jobs that they're losing and whether this uh, delay has benefited anyone, my, my guess is you're going to find most people saying, no, it did not. So it became political. Uh, it remains political. Uh, however, um, you know, we have a goal. Uh, we have a goal to stand up this industry. And as part of that goal, we have social responsibility to help those that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs to uh, better their circumstances. Uh, our staffing in Cambridge, just as an example, uh, is over 70% minorities and female. Um, we have uh, over 40 employees uh, already in Cambridge, just in the medical stores that would easily double. And the city council already put in uh, goals, which we've exceeded by way of um, hiring uh, in those um, disenfranchised um, categories of people. So uh, it's frustrating, uh, Jimmy, uh, not being able to move forward and not getting a lot of communication uh, back and forth. I, I, I've never been through legal processes like this before in any of my other companies. This is the first time for me. So it is disappointing. It feels um, a bit shallow, frankly. It feels political, uh, frankly. And um, I hope uh, that cooler heads can prevail. And as we go through this next round of uh, spending money on lawyers and going to court virtually, probably just like this, uh, which would be another first, uh, that people say, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? What is the real goal? And is there, are there other ways to get to that goal versus um, having the lawyers make a lot of money and having people fight uh, in public over things that they don't need to fight about? Let me ask you, Keith, you brought it up. Uh, you know, we've talked about the political battle and you've talked about your staffing with minorities and women. If the C-suite and the management of Rev clinics were African-American minorities and women, would this be happening in your opinion? Um, I do because they are, <laughs> you know, we're, we're a pretty diverse company, um, across the board. Uh, my, the head of all, all of my retail operations is African American. Uh, the head of my community relations is African American. Uh, our board of directors, um, is, um, majority female. So, um, I, I do believe that, um, this still would have happened. It, it was, um, a point in time, I don't know whether there was something brewing uh, for years uh, that, um, you know, created a forum uh, for this to all come out in, uh, on a head. 
Uh, and it's too bad in, in an industry like this, cannabis, which is so meaningful and, and can be so much fun and, and so sociable, um, ends up in a place where, where people are um, taking sides and uh, creating conflict. So again, if anybody's listening out there, I'm, I'm always open to uh, a meeting in person or on Zoom or on a phone call. Uh, to try to move this business forward in the way that the Cambridge voters uh, desire. You're not, you're not the first to, to express frustration with the regulation and the host security agreements that are out there. You, 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 you've run other companies, uh, Keith. I'm guessing this is the most frustrating experience you've ever had with a startup. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the, the fact that I've been a six or seven time startup uh, CEO says that I'm kind of used to uh, roller coasters. And um, as I often state, even to investors, um, the only thing I'm sure of is, in my business plan is that that's not going to happen. So uh, I've been through 35 years of having to adapt and change and pivot and, and, and create solutions um, in times of crisis and change. Um, I've never been in a political process like this where uh, win-win solutions are, are, are put aside in favor of um, uh, political benefit. Never have. It's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, if we get to the other side and whatever this post-COVID society looks like, what's the Rev Clinic's plan? How many locations? Can you share anything, let's say, on the brighter side, what the future looks like you're excited about? Yeah, so we have... Um, uh, ooh, I think 130 or 140 employees now in Fitchburg uh, that are uh, cranking out uh, awesome flour and, um, uh, and hand sanitizer. And hand sanitizer, yeah. We've, we've produced hundreds of gallons of hand sanitizer, which were donated to the, the healthcare industry in Massachusetts as part of our efforts to participate in, in helping the state get back to um, uh, a new normal. Um, I think that, um, you know, we have a limit, obviously, in what we can do at retail. We have three locations. I'd love for all three of them to be co-located, and that would be it for us as it relates to retail. I do believe there's a pretty big future uh, in home delivery. Uh, we've seen a, a pretty good increase in that business in the last couple of months for obvious reasons. And um, uh, we would love to support an economic empowerment candidate to get into the adult use uh, home delivery business. And we're talking with several about that. So I think that's gonna be a big opportunity for us. And I think uh, by way of uh, production and our factory, uh, we have one of the larger facilities uh, in the state and, and have the ability to expand that even further to provide uh, unique products uh, to those stores and licensees that are opening without their own capabilities to produce and supply their own products. So I see us growing pretty dramatically um, in our facility for wholesale. I see us, um, all three stores being uh, transitioned to co-location. And, and by the way, it's really important to us that they be co-located. We are not going to give up our, our medical license in order to uh, profit uh, from the adult use market. We are going to stay open medical. That's why we were formed as a company. That's what we are going to do uh, and as part of our mission. Um, and so I think the home delivery business, as well as the um, uh, continued increase in our co production capacity, will be a great future for us in Massachusetts. And I'll, I'll give you a shameless plug and then turn it over to Jimmy. I, when I see Ryan, I always tell him, your products from, you know, in Massachusetts can't cross a state line, top notch. All the way from flour to edibles, you guys have great products. And I'm not getting paid to say that. So hey. congratulations. I appreciate it, Kurt, very much. Good stuff. I'm getting paid to say it. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, it, is, it is good stuff. I do want to ask you a question as a CEO, someone who's had a lot of experience. Kurt and I had the opportunity to talk with Joe Lasardi and with Bruce Linton a couple of weeks ago. And they brought up a really interesting um, thing that has developed with this COVID-19, with people having to stay at home, working with Zoom. Um, you're a guy who likes to do the face-to-face -face negotiation, face-to-face uh, management, if you will, and communication with people. But both those guys thought that the future could end up being less uh, office space, if you will, and more um, these kinds of negotiations uh, out of, and 
what, what's your feeling about the future of business and how deals will be getting done? Will it still be that face-to-face -face or can we actually see a transition to more uh, video conferencing? Yeah, I think um, uh, it depends on the industry and um, uh, the stage of the business. Uh, I, I think that face-to-face -face, uh, relationship development uh, and negotiations will never go away. Uh, it's too important, especially when you're dealing uh, with um, big decisions and, and important uh, decisions that affect a lot of people. Um, it's hard to do that via email or, or, or a video chat, uh, frankly. So I think that won't go away. However, uh, there are entire industries. Um, you know, I was listening to some news on the uh, social security industry today, and they're, they're like cranking out just as much business as they ever did before and getting those checks out and nobody's in the office. And so those are t the type of businesses like why spend all that money in office space? Why spend all that money commuting and parking and, and all of the hassle and, and wasted time that goes into that commute? I think those are going to change forever. And, and, and positively so, not just because we have to. Um, I think other businesses, um, you know, like ours, are, are much more interpersonal. And um, uh, I hope <laughs> that we uh, get back to uh, being face-to-face -face as soon as possible. There you go. Kurt, you got anything else for Keith other than uh, we all miss sports? <laughs> uh, yeah. No. I, Keith, I always appreciate your integrity and your honesty, and you've been very forthcoming and very honest about, um, you know, the situation in Cambridge and um you know how that's hopefully going to resolve like you said with a win-win so I, I just appreciate talking to a guy in the industry that's that that has your integrity and, and your good intention because believe it or not it's not everyone out there in this industry as we're finding out daily so thank you for being in it and uh i hope for a good a good resolution that people can be happy you know as quick as possible for you well you guys will be the first to know thank you kurt thank oh. you jimmy really appreciate it all right thank you keith cooper from a revolutionary clinics uh, the ceo there uh, so for Keith Cooper, I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media. You're watching Weed Talk Now. And Kurt, who are you? Cannabis.net. <laughs> there you go. And of course, you can find it on all those podcast aggregators out there, iTunes and Spotify, CLNS Media, and of course, also now video on cannabis.net and of course pro cannabis media as well so remember everybody it's a whole new world of weed out there let's use it responsibly and let's be safe and let's still somehow or other stay in touch shall we weed talk and in the weeds are two productions of pro cannabis media supported by revolutionary clinics one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the massachusetts area now with three locations in greater boston two in cambridge and one on broadway in somerville rev clinics has a patient first mission they will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains flavors and products rev clinics where the patient comes first We are Pro Cannabis Media.